Right, gents, the L293D chip is one of those chips that's been around for a long time, a bit like the, the 555 timer chip, which refuses to die. There have been improvements. Other chips that can do uh, better, but it's still very, very popular, so I thought we'd have a look at it. It comes in a couple of flavours, but the essential uh, code is L293. What is it? Well, it's basically a driver that we can use to control motors, stepper motors, servos, anything that's uh, high current from some low current source, or it could be an ordinary switch. And that's one of the things I'll look at uh, this afternoon. This chip, if you want to, you can run it from a, a PIC or an Arduino, or, but you can also just run it from an ordinary switch or, or something very simple. And we'll look at the various ways of doing it. There's basically two main flavors, the 293 and the 293D. You can see there's a slight difference in what current they can take. When it says 600 milliamps, that means six milliamps per channel. This particular chip has got four, four output channels. So you can control four different LED strips up to 600 milliamps each. Or a peak, as you see, of double that. The 293D variety, what they've got different from the 293, the D stands for diodes. They've got built-in diodes in them so that when you're wanting to control um, anything that's inductive, solenoid coils or, or, or motors or whatever, then the back EMF will, will not destroy the, the chip. Very versatile, can handle lots of current and also can handle from an input of four and a half volts up to 36 volts. So regardless whether it's a five volt device or a nine volt relay or a 12 volt lead strip or whatever, right up to 36 for, let's say, a solenoids, for example, then it can handle all of these. And if it's not enough current from any one channel, as I'll show you later, you can simply common up two outputs to get double the amount of current. Or quadruple, get all four together, all paralleled up. You don't get quite four times, but you get near enough. So you can have a very high current device operated this way. So what actually is this thing then? Let's have a look. As you see from the pictures above me, you can buy it as an ordinary chip. So that's handy if you want to integrate it along with, say, a PIC on a PCB or whatever. And they're not expensive for what they do. One point forty nine. That's not going to break the bank to control four motors or four relays or whatever. You can also buy it already on a module. So for two pound forty nine, you can buy one that gives you controls four outputs. So I was saying you can buy it in chip format. You can buy it in module format. The chip's one pound forty nine. A single module is two forty nine. And it saves you a lot of wiring. You just have screw terminals and so on. Or you can buy it, as, a, as I'm showing down here, which is a shield designed to plug straight on to a, a Arduino Uno for those who want to program stuff. Not only that, for £3 you get a, a shield, but it also has two separate 293s. So that you get that for the price of two of these. So it's a, it's a good deal. So what's actually in it then? For the next question. Inside the chip, you've essentially got four, think of it as four power uh, switches, four, four Darlington, uh, sorry, uh, Darlington MOSFETs that are going to take inputs and give you outputs. So you can see there, one, one A, one B, one, uh, three A, three B, these are all the inputs. And for every input, there's a corresponding output. They've also got an enable pin. So if that's if these chips, that one enable does these two, that enable pin there does these two. 
if you don't enable the chip, these outputs, they don't go high or low. It's as if you just cut the wires. They're high impedance. It's as if they're not there. They've got no effect on whatever they're connected to. But as you can see up here, if we enable the pin, if you put a high on here, then what will happen here is that the output will follow the input. If you put a high here, you get a high in the output. If you put a low there, you get a low in the output. So the output is non-inverting. It will follow whatever it gets in the input, only a much higher uh, current, obviously. And the input can be simple TTL, 5 volts, but the output here can be up to 36 volts. So you can get higher current, but also higher voltages on the output. So we've got four of them, but we can now uh, make operate various devices. Just to show it, I put together very quickly, as you can see, a Heath Robinson demo, a little board that I um, salvaged from a printer, I think, I Epson, put a 293 on it. In fact, I can show you it. Let me just, there it's there. I, on one side, I put some resistors, so I've got pull-ups, and then I can, these are going down to zero, and they go to the inputs, and all the outputs just go to LEDs via droppers. So I've got four different inputs, four different outputs. I can switch any one off and on individually. Or I can do them in pairs. Or I can do them in pairs that way. I can do them diagonally. Can put all four on at one time. So depending on the inputs, will change the outputs. So that's a very basic demonstration. And all we're putting in is five volts in the input to get whatever we want on the output. That's what the chips pins look like. You'll see that. The ground pin, the zero pin, has got four pins on it. They're all commoned up, but the reason for doing that is that this chip alone can handle high currents, potentially. It's got no actual heat sink. There's no uh, hole in it to mount on a metal heat sink. So it relies on the heat coming out, pins 4, 5, 12, and 13, going down into a, P a PCB or Vero board or whatever, and the copper tracks underneath acting as the heat sink. So you're dissipating heat via these ground pins. And that's why there's four. And then you'll see the enables at the top, and you'll see the enable here at the bottom. And you'll see there's two voltages, VCC1, this pin 16, that's got to be five volts. That's what's controlling the, the logic that's inside of this chip. VCC2 is where we put on the voltage for the output. So say we had a, a 12 volt motor we want to operate, we put 12 volts on here. And that would mean that anything we switched on, on an output would be switched at 12 volts or 9 or 15, whatever you put in here. So that's the basic, it's only a 16 pin chip. That's it again, taking out a magazine. And the reason for that is you'll notice that I've circled these two because they've got it the wrong way around. They've said that you can put up to 36 volts in here and put five volts on VCC2. If you try that, of course, you've just blown the chip because five volts max is what's got to come in to power the logic. So I put that there just to remind you that not everything you see on the internet is uh, true. You probably know that already, but it's also true in electronics. It pays to actually download the spec for a chip and look to see. Otherwise, Smoke generation. So there's a very simple implementation of it. 
Down the bottom here, I've decided just to put five volts in to enable it. So it's enabled all the time. So the output here will always follow what the input is. So normally, nothing. The input has got no polarity at all. If I then make it high, the output's going to follow it. The output goes high. So it's high in one end of the motor and it's zero volts in the other end, so the motor will rotate. So a very simple implementation. We throw the switch, the motor rotates. And that switch can be coming from anything, uh, a, a five volt relay and switching an 18 volt motor or whatever. So that, that, that's it at its, uh, at its simplest. And this is it again, another little board that I salvaged from a printer or whatever. And that's all I've done. I've got the enable pin and I've got the, uh, the logic pin, the input pin. And then I've taken the outputs to the motor. And if I now This is the setup. 12 volts coming in, 12 volts motor going out. Logic pin, enable pin. I press with the logic pin its own, nothing happens. I press the enable on its own, nothing happens. I press both, the motor rotates. If I let go of the logic, it stops. If I let go of the enable, it stops. You have to have both active to get an output to the bottom. You know, you're wondering, why do we bother with the enable? Why not just have it there uh, enabled all the time? And I'll, I'll explain that later. We can use it for doing pulse width modulation, essentially. Talking about uh, the spec, this is the two nine, or an extract from the 293D spec. And I thought, well, we can simplify that down a little so we understand it a little bit better. If I do that, just look at one side. So there's a truth table above me that says what happens when the enable is high and the input logic is high. The motor will stop. I'll explain that later. But in this case, the motor has gone up, as you can see, it's gone up to five uh, positive voltage at this end. So any low coming in here will make that low and the motor will turn, which is just what we've got above me. When the enable is high, but the logic's low, the motor will run. The X means if you haven't uh, got any connection to it, it doesn't really matter because as soon as the enable goes low, nothing will output. I'll cover the fast motor stop in just a moment. So that's as when we're connecting the motor up to the positive. And the other part of that table was looking at the right hand side. So let's look at the right, very similar to the, the left. except the motor this time is going down to zero. So we want that to go high to make it work. So a high coming in here gives me a high out, will make the motor rotate. And if we disable the enable, bring it low, then the motor will stop. And it's called a free running stop. In other words, uh, the power goes off and the motor will just keep slowing down, slowing down until friction in the gearbox and friction in the motor takes over and the motor will stop, whether it's, whether it's a loco or any other uh, motor. And that's called a free running motor stop. Now, moving on from there. 
I did show fast motor stop above me. I haven't covered that yet. What is fast motor stop? Well, think of it this way. The blue box represents the 293. And when it's positive at the top, zero at the bottom, it's rotating in, in this example, clockwise direction. But in a previous uh, discussion we had, we spoke about back EMF. We said that a DC motor rotates when it's got power onto it, but it can work the opposite. If we don't attach power to it and we rotate the motor, it becomes a generator. So it, it can actually generate a, 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 an EMF. So in this case, when we're running the motor, it's acting both as a motor and a generator. So it's trying to turn with the, the positive and the zero, but it's also generating a back EMF, as you can see on the right-hand side of it. And it's trying to make the motor turn in the other direction. But of course, the, the power that's coming through in this way is greater than the back EMF here, so the motor does rotate. But the question then is, what happens when we change the polarity coming out of the 293? If we make them both positive, that's the same thing as saying we've made the output transistors essentially just short internally. So we can represent that as a short here internally. Now, the momentum's slowing down, but now there's no other voltage on here but the back EMF. And it wants to turn the motor in the other direction. So you've got the momentum trying to turn clockwise and the back EMF trying to turn counterclockwise and the result is a very fast stop. And I can show you that too. I'll apply the power to this. Right. If I put power on the motor and power off, it takes time before it comes to a halt. Of course, with traction, it'll be a lot quicker than that, but you get the idea. Now, watch what happens when I power it and then immediately short. It immediately stops it because of the effect of the back EMF. In fact, we can show that even without power. If you've ever noticed, if you get an ordinary DC motor, you can flick it and it'll rotate quite happily. But if I now take the wires and short the wires from the motor, it hardly moves. Take the shot off. So that's, that's showing that the effect of back EMF. And that has, allows us to decide what we want to do. We can have either a free running motor stop or a very fast stop, depending on what we do with the outputs here. That's handy to know. Well, I mentioned earlier, if you wanted to increase the current output from a 293, you can parallel them up. So you'll see as an example, the blues show, I've got two inputs on the left paralleled, and two outputs on the left paralleled, and the same on the right hand side. So I'm able to increase the current substantially if I need it for, a, say, a no gauge motor or whatever. This takes too much out of it. So that's DC control. Next thing I want to look at is pulse width modulation. With ordinary DC, we're all aware of it. The speed depends on the voltage. Well, 
until you overcome stitching that is. So in this example, maybe two volts or three volts will make the, the local run slowly. Maybe five or six volts will make it run a fair, fair speed and nine, 10, 11, so on, will make it run fast. But the voltage on the track, i.e. the voltage across the motor, is varying in an analog amount between zero and 12. Pulse width modulation doesn't do that. Pulse width modulation always puts out, say, 12 volts for a 12 volt motor onto the track. The difference here is it's not on all the time. It comes on in pulses. And depending the, the, the width of the pulse and duration of the pulse depends on the amount of power going to the motor, therefore the speed. So there's the equivalent of PWM compared to the DC. A pulse of 12, and then nothing. A pulse of 12, then nothing, and so on. But now, if I increase the pulse with more energy to the motor, it's going to go faster. So each pulse is wider, more speed. And eventually, this is about 90% say on compared to the off time. It's called the duty cycle. So it's on most of the time. So it's very fast. If you went to 100%, it's the same thing as it's always on. There's no off time. So in that respect, 100% and PWM is the exact same thing as 12 volts on, on an ordinary DC. So if I go to all this bother, well, the, the answer in PWM for those who've already got it, most modern controllers do have it, of course, is stiction. You've all had a situation where you've got a loco on the track, you turn the knob, nothing happens. You turn it a bit more, nothing happens. Turn it a bit more, and all of a sudden it shoots away. And PWM is designed to overcome that by having short bursts of high voltage. It gives it a little kick. And the result is that the, the problems with station motors and uh, gearboxes and so on, and valve gear and locos, are all overcome to some extent by using PWM. So we can operate the 293D with ordinary DC, as you saw, just switch it off and on, or we can control the speed by feeding it the uh, enable pin with pulse web modulation. For those of you who want to know a bit more about it, I thought this was a very useful website and given a pretty concise uh, explanation of how PWM works and, how, and its advantages. What I've got here is it's a little video. Down the bottom right, you'll see there's, there's a shield. We'll come back to that. But the main thing is what it's doing is it's sending out a pulse width signal from the 293 here to the motor to make it rotate, but accelerate and then decelerate, accelerate. So it's going slow, fast, slow, fast. And then we're going to pan up to look at the output on my oscilloscope and you'll see what's happening. So let's just play that. Slow, fast on the middle, and slows down at the end. Slow start, goes faster, slows down. And if you look at the oscilloscope, you'll see exactly what's happening. The pulse width gets very narrow to slow it down, gets very wide to speed it up. So that's the output from the 293D when it's fed with a pulse width uh, modulated input to the enable pin. I mean, said that, there's a kit here you probably most of you will recognise. There's a pocket money kit. And it's the kit for the, the LED dimmer. And instead of using it to dim a LED, what I'm doing, I'm feeding the output to the enable pin of a 293. And the pot is not going to adjust brightness of a LED strip, it's going to set the speed 
of the motor. This particular kit runs at a speed of 275 hertz. That's how often the pulses appear, 275 times a, a second. So you can build yourself a very cheap local controller. This was a 293D, which cost £1.50, and uh, a lead dimmer, which cost, I can't remember, a couple of quid or something. And then a double pole, double throw switch for polarity. So for forward and reversal, if you're local, and you've got yourself a PWM controller. If you don't believe me, there's one I made earlier. What you'll see is uh, in the bottom here, we've got the LED dimmer. We're not using the power transistor because we're not connecting it to an external LED strip. In fact, we're taking it straight into the 293 and it's driving straight out to the track here. And the knob here is adjusting the pulse width signal that's going into the 293. Let's see how it operates. That's me switching the power on. Changing the speed. The click you hear is me externally throwing a double pull, double throw switch. In, in fact, the movement of the tram is much smoother than you see. That just seems to be one of the vagaries of recording it. It's not actually moving in, in jerks as it appears there. It's actually very smooth. Right, so we've got a situation where we can feed a motor voltage in. We can feed, if we wanted to, either a fixed voltage or we can feed in PWM into an enable and we can control a DC motor. But now we're looking at, well, why did I have to have a switch that did forward and reverse? External to this kit. Don't have to. I can control it via the 293. We've got two inputs here and two outputs. And we know we can change the input such that that becomes either high or low. And we can change that one input so that becomes high or low. In other words, if we make that one high and that output low, it'll go in or rotate in one direction. If I make that low and that one high, it'll rotate in the other direction. So simply by changing the, the input polarities here from high to low, we can change whether the motor rotates in one direction or the other. We can use that with switches, but we can do better later. And that's the truth table for the bidirectional. Same thing, turn left, turn right. The free running one, let friction take over to slow it down, or the fast motor stop. They make both inputs high, or both uh, inputs low, then both outputs go high or low, then we essentially short across them and we get a fast motor stop like I showed you earlier. That brings up the concept of the H-bridge. A number of folk have, have used it and I thought it might be worth just talking about it. What we're looking at here is meant to be the four main output transformers, F transistors, sorry, that you'll find inside the 293. And they're used to feed a pin out such that if I switch that one on, then the positive appears here, assuming that one's off. If I make that one on and that one off, then that pin essentially is brought down to zero. And the same thing at the other side. You can see why it's called an H. It looks like an H. You've got two 
vertical bars and the horizontal bars. It's called an H bridge. And on the right hand side, we can see it's been represented by ordinary switches. If you wanted to, you could even emulate yourself. Let's get four ordinary toggle switches, put a motor like that, and you can see that it'll do exactly what I said. Oh, if you are trying that, just one thing, never throw A and B at the same time. Or never throw C and D at the same time, otherwise you'll just shorten your supply. So you'd be operating A and D as a pair, you'd be operating C and B as a pair to get your direction. Like that. In the, the left-handed example, we've operated the, the right-hand switch, and down below the left-hand switch, the motor rotates anti-clockwise. If we now switch this one off and put that one on in its place, and the same down below, the motor will rotate in the opposite direction. So we can control the direction depending on if we use two outputs for a motor rather than just one output. The earlier example is one output that either went high or went low. This time we're putting the motor across two different outputs and depending on what the polarity is on these, the motor will rotate correspondingly. That's it in practice with a very simple single pole double throw center off switch. So if it's center off, then nothing's going to happen. They're all, the two outputs have been held high up here, as you'll see, with pull-ups. So that input's held high, and so is the other one coming all the way around, and that one's held high normally. So they're both held high, the motor can't turn. If I now throw the switch, say, to the left, I've brought that one low, so I've now got a low and a high on these outputs, the motor will rotate. If I now throw that same switch to the right-hand side, then we bring this one low. So that's got a low output, and that's got a high output. The motor will rotate in the opposite direction. So we can use a switch feeding into the 293 to decide the direction. And if we put pulse width modulation in, we can also use it to control the speed of the motor. So we can control speed and direction with what you see and that's only half a 293. The, the other half that's going along here is a, a mirror image almost of that, except down the bottom, of course, you'll see the power pin for the motor voltage. Now, here's an implementation. Some of you, or most of you saw Chick's excellent presentation on um, hard gel made easy. But it's looked at the more modern pick chips, which have got a bit of a pig when you, when you want to configure them. And Chick showed how to set them up in an easier fashion. If you haven't seen it, then I'll, I'll be putting the video up uh, soon on our own website. And it was using the, the MP Lab X IDE to do the, the setting up. So I built one because Chick had already uh, made one of those pins available as a PWM output. And you can see a switch along at the end here, which is going to switch the polarity to make the, the local go one direction or the other. And it feeds into the 293. So power comes in at the very top and these pins goes out to the track on these pins. So we've now once again got a complete pulse wave modulated uh, DC controller. I know a lot of you have got DCC, but you might still want this for, for animations in your layout to control motors for conveyor belts or whatever. So let's look. That's it now, ready to go. Center switch will switch it off when we want. Control knob sets the speed via PWM.
And then again, we get slow, smooth running. Now, there's a good friend from earlier on, the, the lead dimmer feeding the 293. That's just, that's just a five volt regulator giving five volts for the logic of the 293. But this time we've put on the switch center off. You can switch either side to get traction moving one way or the other. Here it is, single pole, double throw, center off. Throw it one direction, walk up, goes in one direction, center off, other direction. You can change the speed. It's the pot. We can get slow running. For the standing start. And we can get fast running. Right, that's just a quick recap of what we're looking at. The truth table down below, the fast stop, whether it's going clockwise or anti-clockwise, putting the motor across the outputs, putting the voltage for the motor here, depending on what the motor voltage is. And I've called the inputs X and Y. And in the example a minute ago, I was using a double pull, uh, sorry, a single pull double throw switch to decide. The reason I put X and Y there is, we can go one stage further, we don't have to have a switch doing it, we can now control that, uh, the X and Y inputs using a pick or, or an Arduino, whatever. Why not? There it is. Same thing, the X and Y are now coming out of the, the pick or out of the Arduino, and the pulse width modulation is now coming out of a pin on the pick or the Arduino. Now we've got automated speed and automated uh, direction for the motor. In fact, we ourselves, uh, Wozniak, have used that. That's the Arduino and Nano that we use in the one of our layouts, the back and forth layout. We'll see at the top here, there's the two pins, the X and Y, as I said earlier, coming in to decide the direction of the, the local. And then down in, out here, we've got the pulse wind modulation that's coming in to the enable to, to adjust the speed. And over at the very far end, we've got a couple of totties so that we know when the local is getting towards the end, we can make the local decelerate. And when it's time to come back out of that siding, we can make it accelerate by changing the pulse width. So we can change the speed, we can change the direction based on input from totties and controlling a 293. As you can see, it controls other things as well, the nano, various points and signals and all that. But from a motor point of view, it's just doing what we have here. And the speed control is what we can be used to control the output of the PWM here. Depending on what local we put on it, we may have to tweak up the speed a little bit for a layout. So that's an example of using a 293D with a microprocessor, microcontroller, sorry. Now, We've looked up to now at buying the chip as a discrete chip. I did mention for £1.49 you can buy this little module. There's the five volts that requires to operate the logic. 
there's the voltage it needs to, to drive whatever motor you're using. In this case, it's not as versatile. There's a voltage drop inside the system, so it's nine volts minimum. So you couldn't control a six volt motor, for example, or a five volt motor. But it's got outputs to drive two DC motors, and it's also got an output to drive directly to a stepper motor. I'll we'll cover a little while. And if you want to, you can put PWM to the inputs. There's our enables here. And then you can use this to, as your four inputs for controlling uh, direction. So I've got a complete package here for £1.49 that you can use either manually or via a PIC or Arduino. That's what it looks like. This example has the two enables constantly enabled. So for a stepper motor, we're not controlling the speed with pulse width modulation, we're controlling the stepper motor by how quickly we move the steps. Again, it's another subject, but stepper motor works on the basis, a couple of coils here. When you energize one coil, the motor will, make, will click in one direction. Then you energize the other coil, it will click once more in the other direction. Uh, no, sorry, in the same direction, but one further, one further step. So with each step of the coils, the, the motor rotates one more step, unless you invert the polarity, in which case they rotate counterclockwise one step at a time. So how often we send the pulses to, determines the step of speed. It's not the pulse wind modulation that you get for the DC motor. So that's the, the setup. How do we use it? There's one example, a UNO you know, feeding straight into a 293, 293 feeding the two coils of a stepper motor. What's the component count? Uh, three pieces by the look of it. Except you need five volts to power this, which you can take it off here if you wanted to. So you could run a stepper motor with only three components, the stepper motor itself, the 293, and a you know or a nano. How do we do it? Well, some of you will have seen this one already. It's a basic traverser. And it's just using, as you can see here, we've got a UNO, you know, which has fed the various, again, the ubiquitous panel taken out of something I've recovered of push buttons, which decide how far along the traverser is going to move. And then it feeds in to the 293D. And the 293D, you'll see the wires coming in here in the plug straight to the motor. The only difference is that this is, by the way, taken straight from a, a scanner. The electronics in the scanner had gone, we took the electronics out, but we left in the motor and you can see the drive belt. And this black piece you see here, that's the, the normal carry that goes up and down doing the scanning with, with a, a laser head on it. Took that out and put a bit of track on its place. And we can now move that piece of track over approximately, I think it's 12 and a half inches on that particular scanner. Not only that, scanners, as you know, can work depending on the quality. This one works at 1,200 dots per inch. Now there's 1,200 separate little steps for every inch of movement. So we get a fair amount, apart from a bit of slack, a fair amount of uh, reliability and positioning. Well, that's it close up, just to let you see it. In, inputs coming from the buttons, power coming in to control the UNO, wiring between the UNO and the 293, and the 293 wires feeding the stepper plus a micro switch coming in up to here. The idea of the micro switch is when you're doing steppers, you can have fairly precise positioning. But it's not like, it's not like a, uh, an ordinary servo where you can say go there and it goes exactly there with just one command. A stepper when it's powered down doesn't know where it is. So when you first switch on this traverser, it's got to move to a, a reference position. 
In this case, the reference position is when it comes along and hits the micro switch. And then everything from there on is, do I move 200 steps? They move 400 steps, 600 steps, 800 steps, 1,000 steps, to go back 200. It's only a matter of programming it for the number of steps you want to move, which will then move it in that same amount of inches. Let's just play it. So I've powered that up. It's now homing. It's going to keep going until the carriage hits the micro switch. I've used the micro switch. You could use better things, Hall effect switches or lasers, whatever. Just a simple micro switch for this demo. This traverser is as quiet as your normal scanner would be, of course. In double O over 12 inches, you'd probably get what four tracks. If it's end gauge, you may get oh, half a dozen, seven tracks, even on that little bed recover from a scanner. That's largely a proof of concept, of course. Here's a more likely scenario. One of the members, not one of our members, but Merg member did this. So he has mounted the tracks on a board and the board sits on runners you get for drawers. So it, it can move in that direction smoothly. And then it uses a stepper motor with a threaded rod that then pulls that whole caddy along and stops at the appropriate track that the local comes in off or out of. That's just a more classic implementation of what I was showing you a minute ago. If you want something even less classy, here's my very first uh, proof of concept. And it was recovered from, again, a printer. The little black box you see at the end here is the one that comes out when you've got to change that ink cartridge. It comes out to let you change the ink cartridge and pops back in again. And it's controlled by a, a stepper motor. So once again, this time I'm using a, a pick and a 293D chip, I'm not using a module. All I've done is I've removed the, the assembly that holds the ink cartridges and replaced it with a board that can hold the track. So in a, a little end gauge or 009, you could quite easily have probably embed that as a drop in and you've got a three lane mini traverser if all you want to do is move locos. And that takes us finally to the, the shield. There's the Uno. It's got its own female here. And there's the shield and it's got its own Mail pins, and all we have to do is marry correctly the shield onto the Uno. We're ready to go. There's what outputs here, and there's other outputs there. And there's what inputs. So we're able to control. Locos with screwed connections, screwed connection for the wiring to keep it simple. And all we have to do is learn how to program this now. Very versatile. There's code available for this on, on one of the websites. In this case, we've got it connected to, you'll see at the very top left, it's got three pins so you can connect two servers just by plugging them in. No, no soldering, just plug in the servers. On this side, we've got a stepper motor. Again, if a stepper motor, which usually does come with its own wires, you simply put them into the screw terminals. I've got an ordinary DC motor here, and I'm using it for traction here. 
So I'm using servos and steppers and DC motors and locos can all be connected to this. So there's my little demonstration of it. I've connected up one servo, one DC motor, and one, there's a little stepper in there. which you've recovered, that's from the caddy that moves back and forward in a CD player or DVD player. So if I let, if I let you see that running. Put the power on. Ouch, noisy. Uh, it's to show you that we can operate any output individually or concurrently. We had all three working at the exact same time. Here's another example of just using another stepper motor with a little gear on it and a DC motor. So what we're doing there, we were running up to four Two, three, four, two servos, a stepper, and two DC5, if we wanted to, at the one time from this module, or more, because it's got eight different potential outputs. So a very versatile piece, if you're prepared to do a little bit of investment in learning how to program uh, an Arduino.